Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Greg Alexander about how executive leadership can effectively and sustainably scale their firm, as well as how to choose the right time to exit the organization. Greg Alexander, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. Uh, I really appreciate you joining me. And we're going to be exploring something uh, that's a little bit different than our typical topics. Uh, With your expertise, and I'll share your bio in just a moment, but with your expertise, we're going to be speaking about sustainably scaling businesses and then executives choosing the right time to leave the firm when that's appropriate the exit exit strategy, how to go about doing that effectively. As we get started, I wanted, excuse me, as we get started, I wanted to share Greg's bio with everybody. Greg Alexander is founder of Collective 54. He contributes to entrepreneurs by helping them scale and exit their firms. Greg co-founded SBI, a professional service firm, and served as CEO. Prior to SBI, Greg was an executive at EMC Corporation, a leader in the data storage industry. A uh, really great background. Again, I'm super excited to have this conversation with you today. Before we dive on in, anything you would like to share with listeners by way of your personal background or context? You know, the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, I think of my career in three chapters, and this might be helpful to those that are listening to this to see who I am and what I talk about. So chapter one was that of an employee. That's when I was at EMC, now Dell. I was there for 10 years. Chapter two was that as an entrepreneur, and that's when I had Sales Benchmark Index, was I sold in 2017, otherwise known as SBI, and that was the largest exit of its kind in the consulting business, so I'm proud of that. And the chapter I'm in right now is uh, that as investor, private investor, and one of the companies I invested in is called Collective 54, and that's a membership organization for founders and co-founders of boutique professional services firms. So uh, I mentioned those three things just to uh, let the audience know it's kind of cradle to grave. Uh, in three individual chapters. So I'm in the third chapter right now and plan on doing that for the rest of my career. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's that's really great. And um, maybe you can tell us just a little bit more about your current firm, um, the approach that you take, because I, I think it's a service that's very vitally needed. Yeah, so Collective 54 is a membership organization for founders of professional services firms. So what is a professional services firm? Well, according to the, the federal government, the industry code is 54. So that's why the name is Collective 54. So think of IT service firms, marketing agencies, consulting firms, design shops, lawyers, accountants, etc. And what they share in common is that they're a people business and they're selling and delivering their expertise in some version of the billable hour model. And that type of business has a very specific set of challenges when you're trying to scale it and someday when you're trying to sell it. So members of Collective 54 join and it's, uh, it's like a mastermind group on steroids, if you're familiar with that. And they work with their peers because it's all peer-to-peer based to try to uh, overcome obstacles to scale and exit by sharing best practices with each other. Yeah, I think that's, that's awesome. Um, and like I said, it's very much needed. And I, I'm sure you agree since you started the firm. Uh, it, it certainly can have a huge impact when you just get people together uh, to, to talk about and support each other as they're going through the, the challenging issues that organizations face and leaders and, and entrepreneurs, you know, with a good idea, they get, um, you know, they start their business, they don't always have the, the background, the expertise in all the ins and outs of the day to day running of businesses. And, and certainly once you start talking about scaling, that's a, a whole different beast uh, from you know, the, the initial launch stage. And so uh, having th- that support network, I think, is, is incredibly important. Um, 
So that's that's wonderful. Let's talk a little bit now about entrance and and then moving to scaling. Uh, you know, so many entrepreneurs they're going to start and and their their business is going to stay small. Um, they they have no ambitions of of um, you know turning their their firm into a, a large organization. Uh, but other others absolutely have that as a goal, um, whether it's through investors or just you know the, the organic growth or whatever the case may be. Um, how do you approach the scaling question? Um, how to scale, when to start scaling, how to do it sustainably? Uh, how do you approach that with uh, people in your organization? Yeah, great question. So what we have found within the professional services sector, which again, you know, that's our area of focus. So I'll, I'll, we'll use that as our test case or our use case here. There's a natural life cycle and the life cycle looks like this. So some smart people start a firm. And for the first five years or so, they're in what we call the growth stage. What they're focused on there is acquiring their first set of clients, hiring their first group of employees, and just validating their business model. And the benefit of that stage is that, you know, they no longer work for the man, so to speak. They have the freedom and the, um, the intellectual stimulation that comes with being an entrepreneur. But what they're mainly focused on is funding their lifestyle and just being able to, you know, not have to work for a corporation, but work for themselves. And then what happens at some point along the way is a group of those, not everybody, but a group of those say, you know what, my aspirations have expanded beyond just having a great lifestyle and I want to scale my firm. So what does that mean? Well, that means the 70 hour work week is no longer sustainable. So to scale, it's not about working more. It's about working differently, about th doing things differently than you did in the growth stage. For example, you have to replicate yourself. You know, if all roads go through you and you're required to be in every client meeting or every employee meeting, then the firm won't scale. You become the bottleneck. So there's a series of things you need to do to remove yourself as a bottleneck to scale the organization beyond, you know, the brilliance of the founding team. That lasts for about another five years. So let's say the growth stage is kind of year zero to five. The scale stage is called year six to ten. And then there's the exit stage, which is. 11 plus years. And within Collective 54, we have several members in this category. And what ends up happening there is human beings are curious individuals. And after you've been doing something for 15 years, you have other interests and you want to move on and do something else. Maybe you want to start your next firm. Maybe you want to retire. I don't know, but you want to do something else. So now you got to figure out a way to sell your firm. And selling a services business is a challenge because there's no assets. The assets of people, your people and your clients. It's not like you've got a manufacturing facility or, you know, inventory or anything along those lines. So how you actually sell a business is a different, um, a different set of obstacles. And what happens to your firm after it's sold? And what happens to your loyal employees? What happens to your longstanding client relationships? These all become the area of focus for entrepreneurs at that time. So there's, there's a life cycle there um, that I would encourage your listeners to consider. Yeah, that, that's super helpful. And and again, you may start off as an entrepreneur um, with one set of goals in mind. And I think that the natural life cycle of an organization is important to remember, but also just the ebbs and flows of, of individual interest, a life stage that can influence your goals and your ambitions. So, so you may start off thinking that you want to focus on, you know, just a small scale um, professional service firm, you and a small team, and, and you, that's something you're going to be satisfied with for, you know, the rest of your career, but you get a, you know, a few years into it and very well, you may change your mind. You may decide that you want to scale, or you may decide that you want to exit and move on to something else. And so ultimately I think it's, it's just very important for us to recognize the ebbs and flows uh, of the nascent organization that is growing over and maturing over time, the ebbs and flows of life stage, life cycle, and, and how, you know, people's attitudes, people's desires, wants, needs, uh, ambitions also shift over time. Um, you also talked briefly about the sustainable scaling approach. And like you said, if, if, if everything runs through me, I'm the, the boss and I have to be at every meeting, I'm, I'm going to be the bottleneck that, that simply isn't scalable and it's not sustainable. Um, I might think that I can just do more or that I can just be more efficient and I might be able to, to do that to a certain extent, but uh, over time, you just have to replicate yourself. You have to find other good people to join your team um, so that you can scale sustainably. Uh, 
can you, do you have any examples or experiences with um, firms that scaled in unsustainable ways and, and perhaps how that hurt them in the long run? You know, I think the best example is, let me speak from firsthand experience. So in 2006, I founded a company called SBI, which was an acronym for Sales Benchmark Index. We were in the business-to-business -business sales consulting space. And our clients hired us to help them improve the effectiveness of their sales force. And we served big companies like Hewlett Packard and Phillips 66, et cetera. Um, and when I started the business, I, I was right out of central casting, the way that you described it. So I was a sales leader at a large company called EMC. I quit to start my own business because I wanted to go into business myself. And in the early days, I brought in every client. I delivered every project. And that's the way it was. And then as volume increased, I hired what I called Greg bots. So these were people like me. They were junior people. But I told them what to do. You know, I created procedural manuals and basically said color by numbers. And that worked for a period of time. But again, one day I woke up and I said, geez, you know, I'm getting a lot of personal validation from this. It feels good that clients need me. It feels good that employees need me. But, you know, is this really what I want out of my life? And I think back to life stage, I started my firm in my 30s, you know, and then this stage I'm referring to right now, the scale stage, I'm in my 40s, things have changed. And I started saying to myself, what do, I know, what, do, what do I want to be doing the next 5, 10, 15 years? Like, what's the end game here? So then I started hiring in people that were no longer Greg bots. In fact, they were better than Greg. Um, and I no longer went on sales calls. So I built a commercial sales team. They could go out and sell work better than I could. And I empowered those people. We hired experienced delivery people. So people that could run projects on time, on spec, on budget, way better than I could. And we built up whole departments. You know, we hired a back office team that handled finance and IT and HR and legal. You know, when you're a five person shop, you don't need HR. When you're a hundred person shop, you do. You know, people want to know what their career path is. It needs to be formal training programs and, for, and competencies and all this stuff. So that's what ended up happening, you know, for me over time. Now, and it came down to what did I want? It would have been easy for me to be one of many and just, you know, be a solopreneur and hang my shingle and live my life. But, you know, that wasn't what my aspirations were. But Jonathan, you brought, you brought up a really good point. When I started my firm, those were my aspirations. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. And then, you know, I'm three, four, five years into my firm, my aspirations expanded, my ambition expanded because I saw the market opportunity. And I think it's great counsel that you're giving your readers is, is to is to let that happen. You know, don't assume that the original plan is the only plan. You know, the original plan is going to change over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's completely natural, completely normal. Um, and, you know, so, sometimes I, I, I talk with executives who struggle with that. They struggle with those transition periods. And, and understandably, people like stability, people like a sense of certainty, uh, even if it's, you know, faux certainty, I, I'm, I'm not sure there's any real certainty out there, but people like to at least feel like there's some sort of stability in their life. And when you're going through these transitional stages, 
you know, you, there can be a bit of an exis, existential crisis that you go through. Um, th there's a reason why we, we talk about midlife crisis. Now, it doesn't have to be midlife. You don't have to have a midlife crisis in your 40s. Uh, it can happen in your 20s, 30s, 40s, whenever. It, it's really the midlife crisis is all about these transitional periods in your life as you're seeing what you thought you wanted, what you thought you need. Uh, and all of a sudden you realize that served you for a time. It doesn't really serve you anymore. So now you have to reinvent yourself. You have to figure out what really drives you now and what's going to drive you into the future. And we all go through ebbs and flows of that. We all, you know, shift over time and we don't need to be scared of that. So, um, you know, starting off as a solopreneur, awesome. And if, if that satisfies you and you want to continue that way, great. Um, but it's also completely normal that over time, you know, your feelings might change about those sorts of things. And so you get into the role of, uh, you know, growth and scaling at, at some point. Uh, obviously, there's just so many challenges with that. And you just described building out that the back office staff and the, the departments. Um, absolutely. I, I know so many organizations, if we talk now just from a, like an organizational leadership HR standpoint, so many organizations <clears throat> that they start small. And like you said, if, if you have a team of five, 10 people, you really don't need an HR person. You need someone with some at least basic level of HR knowledge. So you're not majorly stepping in it and, you know, causing problems or, you know, compliance issues or whatever with labor and employment law, but you don't really need HR. But when, when you get up to like 50, 100 plus people, you do. Uh, and I see a lot of times uh, organizations that have scaled rapidly, that all of a sudden they're at that level and they still have nobody. They still have no back end staff for that kind of support. And that's where it gets really scary because they end up inevitably um, causing lots of problems. And it, it not necessarily because they have bad intentions, because they're trying to exploit their people, they're trying to break the laws or anything like that. It's just, they don't know what they don't know. They don't, they don't have that expertise. The, the, the founders and the, the founding executive team, they don't have all that, that skill set. They certainly don't have the bandwidth to do everything themselves. And so you do have to, over time, be able to build out your team and just make sure that you, you have the right competencies and capabilities uh, as you grow, your organization matures, and it, it gets more complex, right? You know, what I see in that scenario for firms that make that mistake, they don't invest properly in the human resources function as they suffer from high employee turnover. And in a services business where your people are your product, high employee turnover is incredibly damaging. Um, it takes a while to recruit, select, hire, onboard, and make productive an expert. And if that person comes into your firm and two or three years in, they quit because they don't see a career path for them, which is something the HR group would provide to them, you know, they're going to leave. I mean, experts, professional services people in particular, they choose where to work. Uh, they're highly employable people. They're in great demand. And if they're working for your firm, you have to have an employee value proposition. An employee value proposition is why should you work for my firm versus somebody else? You know, I ask founders all the time, would you work for you? And if the answer to that question is, hmm, I don't know, you got a problem. You know, and the takeaway here is to build a succession plan. You know, so if you have a business strategy that says, I'm going to go from X to Y over the next 10 years, that has to be married up with a people plan and a succession plan that says, I'm going to need, you know, X amount of analysts, X amount of engagement managers, X amount of directors, VPs, partners, et cetera. And think of it as a supply chain, so to speak where you're bringing people in at certain levels and moving them up over the organization over time. And that's oftentimes, you know, not done, or if it's done, it's done tactically and in, in a reaction, reaction mode, you know, it's in response to some crisis, you know, all of a sudden key employees start quitting and, and you're like, Oh crap, I got to do something about this. My advice to the listener would be, don't, don't let that happen. I mean, be proactive about it and design it as part of the fundamental business strategy, the HR strategy. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, there, there's one example that I can think of. This was a, a family, it's still a family run business, um, but it's a family run business that uh, has been around for 100 years and is quite large today. Um, but it's still, they managed, you know, pretty much the entire executive team is all, you know, members of the original founding family. About a thousand employees and they, they, they hired their first HR person, 
uh, probably about three or four years ago. Um, and so when you have a thousand plus employees and you have no um, HR person, there, there's inevitably inevitably going to be problems. And they finally, after a year, you know, decades and decades of, of successful, you know, running and scaling their business, they finally started to realize that there was a lot of stuff they didn't know how to do. And they, they were, I, I don't know if there was a lawsuit or, or something like that, that woke them up to it, but they, all of a sudden they realized this is something they needed to pay attention to. So they brought someone in the very first time they'd ever had a full, you know, one full-time HR person for a thousand plus employee firm, which is, that is still crazy, right? But at least now they have somebody. That person came in and had to spend the first two years just cleaning up messes, right? Um, making sure they were compliant with uh, employment and labor law, just putting in place um, necessary policies, practices, procedures for the organization when it comes to the people side of things. Um, first couple of years, just simply damage control, right? Just trying to clean things up before they could even start, you know, focusing on uh, other important work that needed to happen. And, you know, it's a cautionary tale. I, I, I think they were lucky that they lasted as long as they did without having someone in that kind of a role with that kind of expertise, without getting slammed with lawsuits, getting slammed with, uh, you know, complaints to the Department of Labor or whatever. Um, they were lucky, but but most firms won't be that lucky. Um, and it, it, it can kill you. I mean, you can have a great product or service, um, but when you start to scale, if you're not keeping track of those types of issues, it, you know, a, a single lawsuit or a group of lawsuits or complaints or OSHA violations or whatever, that stuff can kill you and your firm. Yeah. You know, and a proper HR function has really two benefits. One you just discussed, which is capping your downside risk on the unfortunate thing, like being out of compliance, being sued. But the area that I look, really like to focus on is what's the upside? You know, so for example, uh, in the software business, they say that a great programmer is worth a hundred times more than an average programmer, right? So if you have a strategic HR function that thinks about upside as well as downside, you know, they're starting to bring in much greater talent for your organization. And what does that do to the company overall? You know, that family run business who's been in business for a hundred years, which is no easy feat to be in business that long. They're at a thousand employees. I wonder if they had an HR function, maybe there'd be a 10,000 employees. I mean, a hundred years, is a long time, right? So, you know, what was the opportunity cost? What was the missed cost of not investing properly in the people function? Yeah, absolutely. And you're speaking my language. I completely agree <laughs> on the on the upside of, of uh, good people management practices within organizations. Well, let's let's take our last few minutes now and talk a little bit more about exiting. So you you described the kind of organizational life cycle and the stages that you'll typically go through. And you get to a certain stage, and whether it's thinking about leaving to start another firm or retiring or whatever, whatever your goal is there comes a time where you want to start exiting. How do you decide when that time is? When, when is the timing right for you? And how do you start doing that effectively so that you don't completely disrupt uh, and dismantle all of the stuff that you've been working so hard on? Yeah. So the first thing to focus on is to make sure you have an asset someone's willing to buy. You know, everybody talks about exiting, but you know, the overwhelming majority of people can't exit. And they can't exit because what they've built has no value. It has value to them. But if someone's going to buy your business, you know, they're buying an asset and that asset needs to be valued somehow. And if the asset is just you or a group of you, they don't need to buy you. They can hire you or the equivalent of you. Um, so that, that's the very first thing is to make sure that what you've built somebody wants to buy. And that's a big subject. And given our time today, that could be a conversation for an entirely separate episode. But let's say, for example, that you do have something, you have, you know, a great growth business with repeat and recurring revenue and great gross margins and net margins and uh, patented intellectual property or um, intellectual capital that could be leveraged in new and exciting ways. So let's say you've done all that which is a big if. Now the question comes down to people, okay? So if you're, if you're selling your firm, the person who's buying you is thinking about the future, not the past. And this is a common mistake. Founders say, here's everything I built, pay me X for it. Well, the people that are buying you don't care what you've built. They care about the future. 
what they're offering you is the present value of future cash flows. So let's say you're making a million dollars a year right now. You know, they want to know that you can make two million, or three million, or four million, or five million, and they're going to pay you based on their assumptions as to what that's going to be in the future. So in terms of figuring out when to exit, which is what your question is, sometimes it's out of your control. You've, you want to create that option for yourself by building something that can be sold. That's the first thing. And now you're now you even have that option to explore. And then secondly, if you do have that option, you know, you've got to think about who might, might who might want to buy you for what price and on what terms. And that takes you to the fundamental question. And maybe this is the one thing that your listeners should take away from today's call. And that is distinguishing between what the business is worth and what the business is worth to you. And those are two different things. As an entrepreneur, you got a lot of emotional energy wrapped up in your business and your business is worth something to you. Maybe it's part of your personal identity. Maybe it's part of your personal fulfillment. Maybe it's part of some purpose or cause you're passionate about and that has worth to you. But the, but the firm that's buying you probably isn't placing a dollar amount on that. You know, they're a little bit more cold and they're, they're placing a value on it based on the assets and the, and the potential cash flow of it. So if somebody's willing to pay you more for your business than what it's worth to you, sell it. If somebody's willing to pay you less than it's worth to you, then don't sell it. Yeah, great advice. Um, and of course, this is a very personal thing. Uh, assuming, like you said, it's a big assumption, but assuming we have something that's worth buying uh, that other people are interested in, uh, making the decision on when and how to exit is a very personal yeah. um, decision. Uh, there's so many factors that would go into that family uh, dynamics, professional dynamics, you know, the market, all, all sorts of things. And what types of offers you're getting. But I, I like your your point about just give give yourself the option, give yourself the opportunity by having something that's seen as valuable to others, not just yourself. You know, I I'm passionate about my work. I'm passionate about this the stuff that I do in my firm. Dispassionately though, let's look at it. Let's see what value is actually there. How would other other people value it? And if I can make sure that there's value for other people, then I have the option. And if I choose to sell and I can start uh, looking around and and looking at options, um, great. And uh, but it's it's wonderful to have that opportunity to have the option. Yeah, exactly. well, well, very good. Well, Greg, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. Uh, many really great insights and uh, you know good things, food for thought for me personally, and hopefully for the listeners as well. Uh, before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you find out more about your organization, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. Three ways to get connected. So first go to collective54.com. If you're interested in joining that uh, membership organization, that's one. Uh, number two, on that same website, collective54.com, you can subscribe to our podcast, which if you're listening to this, then you might be interested in podcast. Or you can go to amazon.com and buy my book. It's called The Boutique how to start, scale, and sell a professional services firm. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Greg. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, to find out more about what Greg and his organization can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.